we periodically like to bring on CEOs of Omaha-based companies to uh, find out what those companies are up to and help you understand more about some of these companies in town that are doing great things around the world. And one of those is Schooler. And with us today is CEO Paul Moss. Good morning, Paul. Welcome. Good morning. Thanks for having me on. Uh, good to have you on the show. And uh, I guess uh, we always like to start with a 30,000-foot view. Tell us a little bit about Schooler. Yeah, so uh, Schooler is an incredible company. We were founded 130 years ago, 1892, started in Superior, Nebraska. Uh, we like to share the story that the real Schooler began in 1967 when Marshall Faith bought the company, and that's where our growth has really taken off. And so uh, we're a much bigger company today, headquartered in Omaha, Nebraska, about uh, 1,400 employees globally. And... Uh, you know, sales is, is kind of a number that we, we look at a lot of times. We're around $9 billion in sales, so we've, we've grown tremendously since 1967. Wow. Is, is it private or public? Uh, Schooler's a privately held company, uh, employee-owned, and uh, we really love that about, uh, about the company. It's, it's something that we feel makes us a bit special. And so you, how, how many locations? We have over 100 facilities globally. Uh, our strongest presence and historical presence is North America. So U.S., Canada, and Mexico. Uh, but we do have uh, a, a larger and growing presence in Asia based out of Singapore, but then facilities in Indonesia, Myanmar, and, and a small trade office in, uh, in Shanghai. You know, if you got an extra seat, I've been dying to go to Singapore. <laughs> oh, you got to come. It's, a, it's an incredible place. How many times have you been to Singapore? I've only been to Singapore twice. Okay, I'm, I'm dying... I'm dying to get there. If you have it, I'd highly recommend it. It's a, it's a very modern, incredible We could do a remote from there, Jeff. Sure we could. Yeah, uh, the time zone thing would so, be tough. So the products, you know, a lot of Omaha's known as Schooler Grain Company, and, and you need to go by Schooler now. What is What are the, the products? Yeah, so, and that's our history as a grain company. So we uh, purchase and originate a lot of grain uh, from farmers. So you, you buy from farmers, you don't have farms. Correct. Uh, so we, we buy from farms, you know, store their grain, transport or get it to uh, the demand source. And if you think about grain, it's harvested once a year. So it's got to be stored. And then that, that harvest is, uh, you know, the demand, you're filling, fulfilling that demand over the course of the, of the next season, basically. And so do you, we do, do process anything? We do process, you know, and that's a growing part of our company. Uh, we've been uh, traditionally, before I joined the company, we kind of didn't really view that as a capability. And so that's a new capability we have. Um, probably a big highlight is we built a Greenfield pet food ingredient facility in Seward, Nebraska called Pet Source, but that's freeze-dried pet food ingredients. Uh, it was over a $50 million investment. And since then, we've announced we're going to triple its size with a $75 million investment. And that, that project's Nebraska. underway. Yeah, in Seward, Nebraska. Yeah, which is fantastic. It's an on-trend product. So if you have pets, uh, Try some freeze-dried ingredients, and, and your your pets will appreciate and love you for it. Well, Paul, before the show, I was going back through some of our old Gromha market reports just to look at all the schooler news that we've reported on over the last year. And I mean, there every few weeks it seems like there's a new facility uh, that you guys open up somewhere in the world. There was one recently in Asia for uh, fish. Yeah, fish meal. Food, fish yes. meal, yeah. yes. Which is a really love that stuff. <laughs> it's a very uh, nutritious and important ingredient, especially for aquaculture. Uh, but it's also utilized in uh, in the pet food industry as well. And yeah, I would just comment on our growth. I mean, we um, we're on a very dynamic growth plan. We believe it's a lot. I mean, one, it's important for our shareholders to. You know, that's what I'm here for is to creating uh, value and and uh, um, for our shareholders. And you're going to do that more effectively if you're growing. Uh, we have so much opportunity as a company, and so we've really leaned in that way. And so, kind of, if you're watching the news, there there are a lot of different um, growth initiatives that we have announced in our core businesses, but also um, in innovative new products in different spaces to, to to really expand and grow the company, which has been exciting for uh, for myself, but really exciting for our teams. So, Paul, let's talk a little bit about that new headquarters building. Uh, Schooler had been located downtown, just south of Central High School, for quite some time. Really cool looking building, but uh, recently uh, took a uh, building near 136th and uh, California, completely renovated it. Looks really nice from the outside. Give us a little background on that move. Yep yeah, the the reality is we outgrew it, and uh, you know we loved our location, and a lot of people in Omaha might know Schooler from. 
you attending a wedding, like you said, Tucker's uh, wedding reception was there. My uh, brother. Um, but um, we we outgrew us. We love the space. We would have, uh, if we could have found the right solution for us on the right timeline in downtown, we would have stayed there. Uh, but bottom line, we needed uh, we needed more space and also better functionality. So it was really important for us as a culture, as we evolve our culture in the company, to have uh, a more open, collaborative environment. And that facility was, you know, we were on five floors, really cut up today. All of our employees are on two floors in a much more open format. So it's it really hit the mark on fun, mark on fun, functionality. Uh, but we also needed more spaces. We've grown. We've we've really doubled the amount of employees since I've joined here in Omaha. How long has that been? Uh, six, just, it'll be six years next month. So time flies when We're you're glad having to fun. have you and Julie here. Yeah, I, I love it. So um, during the first segment, Trent and I were talking a little bit about work from home and, and being in the office. How is Schooler handling that transition with the new building post COVID? I guess if you can say post COVID. Yeah, and we look at it post COVID. But I, you know, one during the pandemic, the shift to work from home, we we were really uh, impressed with how well we were able to execute our business. Uh, through that, because we shipped, we, everybody shifted to work from home. Um, as we've come through that, and with our new headquarters, we've brought everybody back, uh, but in a hybrid. And so today, it's uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, expected to be in. Thursday and Friday uh, are flex and hybrid. If you want to work from home and your job uh, enables that, that you can do it. And it really, when we first came back uh, Friday, we had Friday flex, and that really wasn't enough. We had a lot of feedback from employees. And so we went to Thursday, and it really hit the mark for us. And I think most companies are going to have to figure out you know, what works for them, but that is, that's where we landed in it, and it has really worked out well. Well, it seems to me that the tough thing, and we kind of alluded to this a little bit in the earlier segment, um, the, the tough thing is there are so many benefits that come from collaboration when employees see each other face-to-face and the creativity that is generated when you're there face-to-face. And so it seems like it's an awfully difficult challenge for a lot of leaders to get people to be there for that collaboration, but yet uh, uh, take care of this desire that people have to uh, have that time on, on their own and, and remote that they're now used to. Yeah, and I'll comment. Uh, Schooler has five pillars of our strategy, and uh, of the five, two are really about our organization. One is to evolve our culture, a commitment to do that, and that enables things then like the investment in the new headquarters. Um, the other is around increasing our collaboration, and we feel that that'll really unlock value for our shareholders. And so we're we're committed as a company to to evolve our culture, and to do that, you've got to spend time together. You've got to have those relationships. And, and so that's why we feel it's important. We are very intentional about making Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday in the office. So everybody's there and that, that collaboration and engagement and the relationship building is happening. And at the same time, embracing you know, employees' expectations changed after their experience of being at home for an extended period of time with COVID. And we, had to, we felt like it was really important to embrace that reality as well. And so... Um, who knows? You know, right now, that's working for us, and uh, it kind of seems to kind of be the sweet spot for schooler anyway. So you've been in, in Omaha for six years. Per, uh, per, I, I would, uh, Julie and I have lived in Omaha for 32 of the last 34 years. Okay, okay. And then uh, uh, when when I joined schooler six years ago, uh, I had already been in Omaha, so it was really a, okay. a nice fit for us to to be able to have this opportunity. Right. So now. I mean, you could live anywhere you want to, and, and and you like like us, you. You choose to live here, and, and so what are some of the things that you see make Omaha unique? Yeah, you know, and we we love Omaha. Our children were born and raised here. This is home. Uh, one of the things when I attract talent to Omaha, we talk about Omaha being a great city, a simple city. You can get around. You know, there's not the traffic problems that you may have, and yet there's unbelievable opportunities, and there, there's so much investment. That's happening. If you look at downtown, uh, I mean, there's countless examples that you that you highlight all the time. Um, and so Omaha is just a. I mean, it's the the people are fantastic. Uh, schoolers are uh, schools are fantastic, and um, we just we love that the values and the, the 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 vibe and the feel that you have here in Omaha. And that's why you know as we we're making a headquarter change, we never for once thought about what would we relocate schoolers headquarter outside of Omaha. Uh, this is home. We're committed to it. We're really invested in doing everything we can to, to grow Omaha and, and, and help it be successful. So out of the 1,400 employees, how many are in Omaha? We're at a hun- just under 160. 
Okay. So we're very decentralized. I, yeah, that comes with being a global company. Um, but like I said, we, it's about double from when I started uh, right. six years ago. And we, the space that we have is very expandable. So we, yeah, I would I would anticipate that if you said, hey, over the next six years, what's going to happen? We'll probably double again. Awesome. Well, we have Paul Mace with us. He is the CEO of Schooler. Omaha-based company that's growing rapidly with uh, operations around the globe. And Paul, one of the things uh, we wanted to make sure we talk about a little bit is uh, talent recruitment. Uh, We are in this era that is going to last for the foreseeable future in which there are just not enough human beings anymore. Um, What is Schooler doing both locally for leadership positions here in Omaha for headquarters and then around the world for all of the functions you need to just find the right people? Yeah, it's it is a big challenge, and uh, you know, holistically, there's two job openings for every unemployed person in the U.S. So, you know, the backdrop is uh, a very very tight labor market. Uh, we feel like you know we've been fortunate to be able to attract talent to Schooler to be able to execute our business and keep them. Yeah, and yeah, and it, you know, um, the the reason is we're committed to a, a set of values, yeah, and so there's there's really uh, deep clarity across our employee base of what's expected and what it's like, what they should expect from leadership and from the company about what we should expect from one another as we work there. So uh, committed to a culture that is um, um, attractive to, to a lot of folks. And, um, and then just kind of, I would describe it as running the business the right way, doing the right things, a, a culture of safety in our facilities um, and investing in that. Uh, we do, we, we are very intentional about Developing leaders and investing back in the organization for growth to facilitate that, and um, and that pays off. And so, even though the backdrop, and, and when I talk to other leaders, and I spend a lot of time, especially as we navigated COVID, um, engaging with other CEOs to really understand, you know, how, how can I navigate this time successfully? The number one topic over this past year has been talent, has been the the labor challenge, and so it's it's front and center. Uh, I feel fortunate that we're. We're navigating it very effectively, and, and I think that employers have to, have to have to do it right and play their part. But so do employees. And and my concern is that in general, there's some there, there's some people that take advantage of, took advantage of COVID or took advantage of the, their employers. And it you know it, it's so important to, to, to set the ground rules. And I can't imagine what it costs to to lose a good employee. You know, it's it's a given that both employees and employers have to be good have good character and, and strong work ethic but employers need to realize the cost of losing someone that has a, a track record someone that has embedded in the company and then to retraining the next people and and I've seen that where there's a transient workforce and and um, it's kind of scary yeah it, and it really is disruptive you know so we, we put a lot of effort into doing the right things to retain talent. Uh, we have a pay for performance culture, and that can that can really go a long way. Uh, where where people are rewarded for their performance. If Imagine back, that. If you go back to our founder Marshall Faith, he believed in sharing the success of the company with those that create it, and so that's that's a unique part about our culture. And so today, the reason we're employee owned is because of that 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 decision. You know that like share the success with the co- of the company with those. And so, as we've grown, um, our, our retention rates compared to industry benchmarks are you know, very favorable. And I think it, it probably speaks to that. And it pays off. To do it. It, re- it really does. It, and it, as you said, it is, it's costly uh, when you lose talent it, to retrain them. And that, you know, the time and the effort that that takes and the disruption that it creates is, if you can avoid it, it's, it's smart to do. We're talking with Paul Mace, CEO of Omaha-based Schooler. And Paul, other than talent recruitment, the other big global business issue lately has been supply chain. And your company is part of the supply chain. Talk to us a little bit about uh, what supply chain issues mean to you and and your leadership team at Schooler these days. Yeah, so, you know, the big part of our company is agricultural products and the, the way we transport it's rail, truck, and container. Uh, the the rail uh, perf- the performance of railroads is really challenged. And to kind of give you a backdrop, uh, they're testifying with the Surface Transportation Board today uh, because of their execution challenges. And the underlying reason is labor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they they they're struggling to get labor to to uh, operate their business and execute their business. And we feel that. 
Uh, same with the trucking industry. There's a shortage of drivers. That's kind of well known and pretty you know in the media a fair amount. Um, and so our teams have yeah really had to stay focused on how can we get our ex- our, our business executed with the backdrop of uh, execution challenges on rail, on truck, and then containers, which a lot of consumers you know they're waiting on their new refrigerator, furniture, those things that, that uh, a lot of times are manu- manufactured overseas and, and brought into the U.S. School- Schooler plays a role in shipping containers, those containers back to demand with agricultural products. And uh, the, the shortage or the challenge of getting our hands on containers, very evident as we went through the last year. There's some signs of some moderation. Uh, but it's been a, a very disruptive time here over the last, uh, I'll call it, 18 months. But in, in the past, hasn't there been a glutton and an excess of containers coming from from Asia and different places where, to the point where people are building coffee shops and, and cities out of containers? But you're saying there's a shortage now? Yeah, the, the global shipping industry pre-COVID is pretty depressed. Uh, they, they struggled. There were some bankruptcies, uh, consolidation that took place. As COVID hit and all that disruption happened, a, a huge amount of new consumer demand. You know, folks weren't spending. You know, they they started spending their money differently when everything was shut down. The home office, all those equipment they need. Every, you know, treadmill. You name it. I mean, all the things that you would read about, uh, very real. And the system just couldn't handle it. So you, uh, L.A. Long Beach, one of the busiest, largest ports in the U.S., had 140 ships waiting to get unloaded. Right now, we've we've worked uh, um, through that. I think there's around 20 ships today. Oh my God! So so it is somewhat better, uh, but very disruptive be- because of the shock to the system. I'll call it, and um, and so shipping rates. Just this will be kind of a, an antidote. Pre COVID, it was around two thousand dollars to go from Asia to the U S. Uh, during the height of the pandemic, there was. Uh, Rates that traded as high as fifty thousand. I'd say the going rate is twenty thousand, but today it's around eight thousand. So you could say it has moderated, but it's still four times higher than it was prior to the pandemic. That's still Crazy. a crisis, yeah. yeah, yeah. And that drives inflation. You know, inflation is such a, a a big deal, but you know those transportation costs get passed on to the consumer. Well, with that, Paul, we're we're out of time, but we're going to have to have you back someday because there are other things we would like to talk to you about. But uh, we appreciate you so much taking the time to uh, introduce Schooler to our listeners and share about uh, things about where your company's going. Really appreciate you having on, and I'll I'll come on anytime. Just let me know. All right. Well, it's our pleasure. That's Paul Mace, CEO of Schooler, based here in Omaha, operating around the world. If you like this video, be sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons. And remember, Grow Omaha is not just media. This is a mission. We are trying to build up Omaha and make it an even better place. We can only do that with your help. Share this video with your friends, neighbors, and family.